Now let's talk about support vector machines. Ooh, uh, all right. Support vector machines. It's the same concept, actually. Okay, okay. So we have the data points. We know about those. Yeah. We have like, those blue data points here. We have red data points. Yeah. Every data point has a location in the space. So the location in space here is x. Yeah. So that's just like a vector. In a two-dimensional space, it's just like a two-dimensional vector. If this is data point i, it's the location is x, i. And every data point also has a class, blue or red. And this class I call y. Since I don't want to write blue and red all the time, I call the classes plus one and minus one. Mm -hmm. Okay? So Got it. those are the two classes. So my question to you now would be, um, can you maybe show me if you would like to separate those two classes, where you put, where you would put the separation? So we need something like long, like like a stick or a ruler or something. Uh, Gandalf, can I use your wa your wand? Uh, oh, that's okay. excellent. All right, well, let's use it. Sure. Well, you can do this. Uh, just place the wand somewhere where you would like to place it to separate those two groups. Okay, then. Yeah, right in the middle. I think that's a pretty good choice. Um, but actually, why there, here? You could also put it some, for example, there. Or here. Or yep. like diagonal. Ah, like the bridge. Like the bridge. Like why the bridge. Are you, why are you not doing this? I don't know. I just naturally assumed I have to, I would put it in the middle because that's an even separation. Exactly. And the reason is like on for the bridge, you want some safety space because you never know where those data points are really are. Yeah. Exactly those data points you didn't see before. So if here's another data point, or let's say here, and you're going with a diagonal like that, you're doing an error. So you yep. don't you want to avoid this. That's why a little bit of safety space on both sides. Is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I believe that's called a hyperplane. Well, this the separating line in the middle is indeed a hyperplane, but the safety space here we call a margin. Ah. So let's draw this hyperplane now, some color. So this is the hyperplane we're using for separating those two data points, and that's of course, as you can clearly see, exactly in the middle. Yes. Um, clearly. So and the safety space on both sides is margin. This hyperplane is defined by a vector we call w. All right, and just believe me for a second, if we normalize the space in a good way, then we can actually calculate this margin by one divided by the norm of w. That's basically the length of this vector. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's do a little bit of math. That's going to be interesting. In order, if you have a hyperplane like that, and this hyperplane is a norm vector, in order to calculate on which side, the plus one side or the minus one side, a data point is, you can use the so-called dot product. So w is the norm vector here, x is the data point, plus b, which is just some offset, forget about this. You calculate this dot product, and then you take the signal function here, which is delivering um, plus one if this is a positive number, and minus one if this is a negative number. So this function here, if you have a norm vector w and an offset b, this actually for a new data point, let's say this one, would calculate for this hyperplane if this is data points on this or that side. Okay. So that's the prediction part. So for a new data point, you can use this function to predict this. So at the same time, you, if you know the true label for all the data points i, the true label is y, we have seen this before, and we build the product between this true label y and this dot product plus b, then we can say, if we, are, if we want to be correct for all the training data points here, so for all data points i between 1 and n, we have a total of n data points, this product should be larger than zero. And to be honest, yeah, well, can, we can use a zero here, but well, I can do a little bit of tricks here, a little bit of magic. Nice. Yeah, right. So we can do a little bit of magic here, and then we just re, well, normalize the space that actually we want to be larger than one. And only in this case, we can calculate, by the way, the margin like that. Okay, so okay. That's, that's the basics. Now let's make the next step. We want to maximize 1 divided by the norm of w. If you want to maximize this, that's the same thing as minimizing, just at another normalization factor here, uh, 0.5 uh, times the norm of w to the power of 2. That's the same thing. doesn't really matter. If you maximize this, you can also mi minimize this one. So maximizing the margin is the same thing as minimizing this term here. And you remember a couple of weeks ago, we had one uh, episode of Five Minutes with Ingo where we talked about overfitting yeah. and the complexity of functions, that we always would like to well, use simpler functions. Maximize the margin is really like, like minimizing the complexity of this function here. Maximize, this is a more complex function in this sense than the one in the middle. Okay. So that's this part here. The bad news now is, well, 
let's have a look first before we come to the bad news let's have a look here and at the same time we have the same uh, constraints here so we want to minimize this subject to for all data points this product here should be larger than one we've seen this before so now the bad news is let's see one say one of those data points is here if we now want to come up with the maximum margin of a hyperplane here we need to use this function here to separate this data point like this but we already see like uh, that looks more like an error like an outlier probably that's not a good idea so and indeed we could just say you know what forget about this data point it should be on this side if you do some error here for this data point i it's one whatever actually that was already data point i so this can't be data point i again but whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. so so we, we can calculate the error because of the, it's on the wrong side of the hyperplane we call those errors um well in greek it would be she i think here it's chi yes yeah, chi. so all right so we have some errors here and now we can just sum up all those errors. That's what we call the empirical risk. So the sum of all errors at the same time should also be minimized because we want to minimize the complexity and we also want to minimize the sum of errors. So th since those two things are conflicting, we need to introduce this parameter we call, well, this trade-off parameter C to actually make this trade-off between complexity and risk. Okay. At the same time, since we lower now a little bit of a slack, we, we subtract this chi, chi i here for all those um, constraints. Now, um, now it's getting a little bit more complex. I think mm. it was rather easy uh, so far. Would you agree? I, I would agree. Okay, cool. So now we, are, we have like an optimization problem with a constraint optimization problem. And typically, the way how you can solve this is by introducing so-called Lagrange multipliers. And those multipliers, alpha i, they actually give some, some sort of weight to all those constraints. So if this here is zero, then this constraint is not very important, but if this is getting a high value, then this constraint is getting more important. By doing so, you can actually add those, those constraints into the function, and I just realized that I forgot to see here, into this function, um, and just sum up both together. So you don't have a, a constraint problem any longer, and everything is in one line, and you would still like to minimize this. So now, again, for a second time, a little bit of magic happens. So we could spend the next hour now doing that. Again with the magic? Yeah, I, never, a lot of magic today. So, a lot of magic happens, and we're not discussing this. Okay. But what we're actually doing is we built a so-called wolf, wolf duel. And this one is this function up here. So, now all of a sudden this function has changed. So you can wow. see there's no longer um, the, uh, the, the, the W vector here. We have our Lagrange multipliers, alpha. There are all labels i, uh, sorry, y, and there are all the data points x. Yes. And this is a double sum, and this double sum, what this really is doing is, it goes through all the combinations of data points and is calculating the similarity, because that's really what a linear dot product is doing. It's calculating the similarity between all those data points xi and xj. So we get new constraints, so those Lagrange multipliers, they actually are between zero and our trade-off parameter c. So if this parameter is very low, we are not really allowing, well, errors, or actually errors are less important, let, let's put it that way, and then all the data points are actually no longer important because all the uh, Lagrange multipliers get zero. Anyway, um, so this is the result, and it's very interesting to see, well, there's a little bit of other stuff here, that this is actually very efficient. So you can figure out, or you can solve this max optimization problem here in a very efficient way, in fact, if n is the number of examples, it's in a cubic runtime, so it's very fast, and it's only linear because of the dot product in the number of attributes or, or dimensions of the data space. So that's what makes SVMs very great, because it's a very efficient way. And then the last thing which makes SVMs so great is that this dot product, which is just a linear function, can also be replaced by something we call a kernel function. And a kernel function is a dot product, again, in a higher dimensional space. And this higher dimensional space can be reached by applying this function here, which can even be a nonlinear function. And that is interesting because then all of a sudden, if the original space looked like that, which is clearly not a nonlinear, or this is not a linear problem, can be transformed into this space. And in this new space, it's becoming a linear problem. But overall, the complete SVM stays the same and is even solving nonlinear problems. So, why are SVMs so very, very magical? Well, they are magical because this maximum margin over here, mm -hmm. this concept here means 
you have less risk of overfitting. They are magical because they are very fast. So if we compare this to whatever, deep learning, neural networks, all those other techniques, actually they usually take much more runtime here. And the last point really here is they can solve linear and nonlinear problems. And that's pretty cool as well with the same technique. So that's all good stuff about SVMs. Um, so any questions? Why are they called support vector machines? Well, Excellent question, Greg. Oh, thank you. Um, so you remember those Lagrange multipliers? Yes. So see what happens if this Lagrange multiplier for a certain data point i is zero. Then all of a sudden, this whole product here is zero as well. That means this data point doesn't matter at all. So only those data points where the Lagrange multiplier is higher than, than zero, those points matter. And it happens, those are the data points very close to the hyperplane, like those here. In some sense, they are supporting the hyperplane and all the other data points they get a Lagrange multiplier of zero and they don't matter. So only those support vectors, those are the important ones. And that's okay. it.